Now welcome to the stage our friend Chris Petrello. Let's hear it for Chris. Thank you, thank you. It's, how's this sound? How do I sound? Yeah, we're good. Um, that's me. Uh, my name is Chris Petrello. I'm the assistant curator of anthropology here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And what does that mean? What do I do? I um, oversee the, the research um, on our collection. It is a global collection of material and culture, uh, material, culture, and art. Uh, so the bulk of the collection is indigenous North American material, culture, and art. So I spend a lot of my time working with community partners, working with museums co consultants on reconnecting the pieces, the belongings in this collection to the originating and descendant communities for whom they are not objects or scientific specimens, but beings with profound importance to ongoing cultural practices, very many of them. There's also things like uh, fishnets and you know, things of everyday use, but the real concern in my work is to transform or try to transform these spaces into spaces of healing rather than harm. Um, and that's something I'm gonna talk about throughout my, my talk. That work ha happens with a huge team of people, including consultants and community partners, collection staff, conservators, colleagues, people who help run events and run shows. So the goal is to make this an institutional commitment to doing better and being better. Um, and I get to play a small part in that. So that's what I spend most of my time doing. Um, I'm gonna talk today about sanctuary. And when I learned that that was the theme for my talk, I was really, really excited. Uh, but I was also really nervous, uh, kind of anxiety inducing to think about sanctuary. I mean, it's such a big, idea and it's seemingly universal. I mean, look at all the name tags in here. We all in some form or another seek out healing and protection and safety. Uh, I mean, I think for many of us, the, the stress of work or the indignities of everyday life require us to, to re-examine ourselves and figure out what it is that we can do for ourselves to you know, not only get up the next day, but to do it with with energy and with passion and with a commitment to ourselves and our shared humanity. Um, but as the name tags here suggest, we all do it in different ways. Some people do it individually. Some people go to a place. Some people look inward. Some people do it collectively. And I think for me, when thinking about my work, um, I was like, what do I do for myself? Um, which I realized was, probably not as much as I should, but I was like, well, what do I do in my free time? What do I do to relax? And I thought, I bake. So let me talk about baking and its process. Uh, maybe it has meditative qualities because it's, um, it's so kind of routine. You do things at the right time, at, at the right pace, every time you make something. Um, and then I realized that, mm, mm, this is really stressful for me. I, I wish I could say that I enjoyed the process of baking, but I don't. Um, it's, uh, I agonize over every little detail. When things don't go right, I get super pissed. And then when things come out really well, like these bagels or these cupcakes, I'm like, well, that's what, that's what was supposed to happen. Like, there's no, the source, of, the source of joy for me is giving it to other people and letting them enjoying it and the validation that comes with people saying, oh, that was so good. And I'm like, yeah, that makes me feel good. But that's not sanctuary, right? That's, uh, you know, maybe seeking validation or like maybe doing a nice thing for somebody if we're being generous to me. And I'm the one with the microphone, so I'm going to be generous to me. Um, so then I thought more about, about the concept of sanctuary. And I was like, well, no, that's, you're OK. You do enough for yourself. You, you're, you trivialize sanctuary by conflating it with your hobbies or your passions. And the you is me speaking to me here. I'm not addressing you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to talk out loud about myself for the next 20 minutes. Um, so I was like, well, maybe what, what is sanctuary? Um, and when do people seek it out? And I think in the modern sort of last 45 years, we see periodic episodes of sanctuary movement. So I was like, well, let's start there. Let's look at the sort of secular, um, secular notions of sanctuary and how it intersects with spaces like churches. So in the 1960s and 1970s, 
the first, one of the first modern sanctuary movements was uh, churches and cities protecting war resistors and deserters from prosecution by military police or federal marshals who were rounding up and arresting people who weren't reporting for duty based on their draft status. Um, and I think what's really interesting about this is one um, that the power of the church to, to make claims about its status as a space of sanctuary is rooted in ancient times. So evoking a uh, historic or archaic practice in a modern co context to stand in defiance of the state as a moral obligation to protect uh, righteous uh, objectors to, to an unjust cause. Um, and I think what's kind of challenging about that is that, you know, everybody involved in these sanctuary movements recognized that this was a purely symbolic power, that the church or cities did not have the legal authority to protect people from prosecution, even though in historic times, churches did have that. Um, so here's another example. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, people fleeing Central America, places like Guatemala, Ecuador, El Salvador, the civil wars and conflicts between right and left wing paramilitary factions found their, found their way to the United States and sought sanctuary again in churches and cities uh, in defiance of INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Services. Um, and again, purely symbolic. And what I kind of noticed in going through these, these newspaper articles was that every episode where we see this happening, it's described as something, something new or novel based on an ancient practice. And there isn't really a lot of uh, collective memory around the, the modern sanctuary movement, um, which I was like, well, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder why that is. And you know, again, here's another example from, from more, recent, more recent times, uh, people seeking sanctuary in churches to protect themselves from ICE and cities proclaiming themselves sanctuary cities, again, uh, purely symbolically, unfortunately, but why is it that people seek sanctuary in churches? What is it about the space of the church that provides access to healing and safety? And then sort of kind of paradoxically, how do we reckon with the fact that churches can and are spaces of deep harm to many people? Sanctuary for one person is not sanctuary for another person. It's actually deeply, deeply traumatic. And I promise this will come back to museums, but I think you can see where I'm going with that, uh, that spaces of sanctuary are also spaces of deep harm. And how can we reconcile, can we reconcile those things? And I don't think we'll answer that today, but I think it's important to kind of trace the sanctuary the concept of sanctuary back to its sort of historical antecedents. So sanctuary in Latin literally means a place for keeping sacred things. So typically they were, um, you know, uh, small shrines to polytheistic deities that people would ask for favors or leave offerings and thanks. And um, we see concepts of sanctuary all over the world, but I'm gonna start with the sort of the Greek and Roman tradition of temples and shrines. Um, and that'll make sense in a little bit too, I promise, I hope. Uh, so the Parthenon, uh, the temple to Athena, which formerly housed a monumental statue of Athena called Athena Parthenos, is actually part of a complex on the Acropolis with multiple sites dedicated to the goddess Athena. Uh, this site was chosen because it is where Athena and Poseidon competed for control of Athens. Uh, Athena won that competition with Poseidon by touching her spear to the ground, and at that point, uh, an olive tree emerged. And the olive tree is, uh, uh, was, at the time, a critical commodity for the Athenian city-state, so immediately establishing a relationship between the polytheistic deities of the Greek world, uh, the land upon which this sanctuary was built. And, um, and yeah, so to talk a little bit more about this, uh, this is obviously a, a ruin. Where's my little, where's the button? Use your 
not using my hand. Again, we're in the picture. Um, so what, um, I think what's important here is that this was a space of the Parthenon itself was not a space of worship. Most of the sort of worship or offerings to, and shrines and sanctuaries were at smaller sites around the Acropolis. Um, but here, I think we see the sort of monumental commitment to the celebration of the patron deity of Athens. People would go and ask for favors. They would leave offerings at specific times of the year in ceremony, but really at any point in the year. Um, but in addition to that, the, this version of the Parthenon that we see here was built um, as a testament to a number of things. Uh, Athens triumph over the Persians, as well as Athens ascendancy as the preeminent city-state in the Hellenic world. So yes, this is a space of ritual, a space of sanctuary, a space of offering and communication with the divine, but it's also a powerful symbol of state power, of a new religious, political, and economic order being um, imposed on, on, on a landscape. Um, and I think that, I think cynically, it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, can it really be a space of sanctuary if it's all of these other things? And I think for the time being, let's suspend disbelief and say, yes, it can be all of these things. It can be a place where people, you know, in Athenian cults worship. It can be a political statement, and it can also be an economic center. So these are the Parthenon marbles. And this is, we're going to start to get to museums. These are in the British Museum. Um, they have been the source of immense controversy since they were removed from the Acropolis site by Thomas Bruce, the seventh Earl of Elgin, which is why they're called the Elgin marbles. Um, he was uh, an aristocrat, a social elite, and the ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire had control of Greece at this time. And he said, I like these, and I'm going to take them back to England, and I'm going to put them in what will become the British Museum, because they are world treasures, and they belong in Britain. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, it's, there has been recent conversations about repatriating or returning these to, the, um, to Greece. Uh, there had never been any real movement on that, but there's starting to be conversations. But I think it kind of again, addresses this paradox in the context of a museum. These are a source of great pride for some. It, the museum is a place for keeping these sacred things. This is from the east pediment of the, uh, the Parthenon. It depicts the, the birth of Athena from the head of Zeus. Those central carvings are gone, and these are the kind of remains of it. The Parthenon was, um, you know, uh, there was a fire, it was sacked at some point, and then it was turned into a church, actually, and then after that, a mosque. So that's also something I'm going to keep coming back to, is the repurposing of sacred sites by subsequent religious orders. Um, we could talk a little bit more about why and how that happens, but these kind of, the continuity established, the imposition of a new religious, political, economic order, um, and I think simultaneously the erasure of the violence that precedes the establishment of new political, religious, and economic orders. I promise this isn't going to totally be a downer, but I think it's important to, to hold both of these, the, the, the tension at the front of our minds. So with that, churches. Churches have physical places in them called sanctuaries. Typically, it's associated with the high altar. It's where the church's most important relics are kept. It's, a, it's also the place where, if you are able to see, receive communion in the Catholic faith, I grew up Catholic, so that's predominantly what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, that is where you receive the Eucharist, the literal blood and body of Jesus Christ, through the power of transubstantiation. No one can explain how that happens, but it does, apparently. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't mean to make light of it, but I kind of do. Um, so these early, so this is a rendering of St. Peter's Basilica, uh, which no longer exists, and on the right is the version that we know today. So I'm interested in how we get from this to that, what that says about the things contained inside, how people are interacting with objects and the built environment to uh, 
manifest supernatural or spiritual presence. Um, and so, yeah, it's a little bit of architectural history, a little bit of theological history, none of which I am an expert in. Uh, I don't do any of this in my day-to-day -day, uh, work. So, so yeah, we're going to go on a little journey together. So the original basilica is based on uh, the Roman basilica form. And we see many of the same features. So a narthex, facade, nave, a crossing transept. Um, and these are kind of architectural features that will be elaborated on in the medieval period, especially, especially in Gothic cathedrals. But this was used in Roman times as a court of law or a public assembly. So uh, making a, a physical connection between the historic practices and the new religion being imposed in the Roman world in around 300 uh, CE by the Emperor Constantine, who converted to Christianity, signed the Edict of Milan, which uh, banned uh, the, the persecution of Christians. And uh, he built this basilica over the tomb of the, the purported tomb of St. Peter, the, the Christian martyr and first pope of Rome. So again, we see people making specific connections between land, between historical events and historical practices, but repurposing them for new, for new religious, ceremonial, and spiritual experiences. Um, and this is what we have on the right, built in over decades and hundreds of years in, and still kind of ongoing. These spaces are kind of iterative in that way, where there are things being refurbished or added to. Um, and this is St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. And this is what it looks like inside. So these two monumental sculptures by John Lorenzo Bernini mark very, very important spaces within the church. So the, the baldachin, which we see on the left, is a massive gilt bronze canopy that sits over the high altar of the church, or the cathedral, I, sh I should be specific. Um, it is also marks the site of St. Peter's tomb. St. Peter was martyred in the Circus of Nero, uh, which is also closely related to this current site, um, and his uh, relics and his body are purported to be underneath here. So we have a visual and symbolic marker of one of the most sacred spaces in the Roman Catholic world. And then on the right, we, at, behind it, you can see what's on the right, kind of right here. I should also say that this is a statue of St. Helen. Um, that's Constantine's mother, who became a saint after her death. And she is carrying a massive cross because she brought a piece of the true cross back from Jerusalem to, to eventually the Vatican. Um, these relics, bodies of saints, bodies of martyrs, bodies of popes, uh, pieces of the true cross, uh, relics associated with the three wise men or the magi are critical elements of church architecture and the built environment. So on the right, what you see is a reliquary for the for the chair of St. Peter. It's the it houses inside of it the chair that St. Peter sat in when he taught and preached to the people of Rome. So we see an, a massive veneration of objects to create access to divine power, whether that's to ask for forgiveness, receive communion, thank those divine powers for offering assistance, that there is a fundamental relationship between the built environment material culture or relics or objects and people and the ways in which they interact with these spaces produce divine effects. So this is um, uh, a floor plan and an aerial view of the Cologne Cathedral, which is in many ways the, the height of Gothic architecture in the, in the sort of Roman Catholic world. Don't tell the French that I said that, but <laughs> I think it's uh, really a, a impressive for a number of reasons. So again, this cathedral built on an ancient Roman site that was a granary and then a Roman sanctuary and is now 
a Catholic cathedral, and this is the basilica format. Not all churches take this exact format. The, the St. Peter's Basilica is not a basilica, in fact, architecturally speaking. But I think kind of understanding the interplay between what you see on the outside and what you experience on the inside is really important here. So on the outside, it's, it's one of the tall, it was one of the tallest buildings in the world for a very long time. Gothic architecture and the use of flying buttresses. Um, it, it allowed the walls to be thinner, to add more windows, to increase the height of the vaulted arches. Um, but it's, you know, it literally reaches for the heavens. And I think this kind of being situated in this really contemporary urban um, setting in Cologne, Germany, really gives you a sense of the desire for permanence of these spaces. Um, and it's sort of on the outside, sort of fortress-like. You can't really see what's going on. The facade protects what's going on inside from the outside secular world. But on the inside, it would be filled with light, beautiful vaulted ceilings. Um, and uh, how would people experience this space? Well, it would be a site of pilgrimage for many. So they would leave the material world and enter this space. And as you move through the space closer and closer to the high altar, which would be somewhere around here, the holiest place in the building, because it is where one receives the Eucharist, the blood and body of Jesus. Um, so there is this sort of processional, otherworldly transformation that is intended to happen in these spaces. Um, and I think that that is uh, critical to understanding how people would move through the space at the time. No church pews. People would be visiting at all hours. In all of these areas, there would be other relics and reliquaries that people would leave offerings at, maybe their favorite saint or someone that was important to them. And then we have another site of pilgrimage uh, in, in, in Mexico, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe. And I think this is where concepts of what is called syncretism, or the idea of appropriating other elements of a, of a religion or cultural practice to make it more appealing to in local populations um, and to, again, I think, erase over the harm and trauma and violence that comes along with the spread of Catholicism in what some people call the New World. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. and the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe, how she has become a sort of national and cultural icon of Mexico, but how it's rooted in a complex story about colonialism and forced conversion and how it is intended to sort of gloss over that really troubling story. So in 1531, an indigenous convert named Juan Diego was near a hill. That hill is where the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe currently is today. And he was visited by a, by a young woman dressed in customary clothing who spoke to him in his native language. And she told him that he is, that she is the Virgin Mary and that he should go to the bishop and ask him to build a sanctuary in her honor on top of this hill. Juan Diego does this. Uh, the bishop doesn't believe him. Mary visits Juan Diego again. Again, the bishop doesn't believe him. Juan Diego is visited a third time, doesn't believe him. And then finally, he um, goes to the apparition of Mary. She gathers flowers that don't grow naturally in, in that area, puts them in his tilma or his like, cape or cloak, and tells him to show it to the, to the bishop. And when he unfolds his cloak in front of the bishop, this image is left behind on his tilma. So it is in ways like a version of the Shroud of Turin, the burial cloak of Jesus that bears his effigy. Um, again, these, there is no evidence that this ever happened, that, but these stories were critically important for enforcing a new religious, political, and economic order onto indigenous people who had been colonized. At around the same time that this is happening, indigenous peoples throughout Spanish colonies are being rounded up and put in reducciones, or settlements where they are forced to convert. Their life ways are being systematically eradicated by these authorities that are creating narratives around 
cultural practices that erase this history. So th th this is part of that story, and it's inseparable from that story. But despite that, the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe has become a, a national and cultural icon. The Virgin of Guadalupe was beatified in the late 19th century, so she was made a saint. And this is a small tin portable altar uh, called a retablo. Um, these became increasingly popular in the 19th century as tin was being imported to uh, create roofs in, in, in Mexico and Spanish America. Um, this would not have been used in a church or a cathedral, but this would have been used in acts of private devotion, private altars and personal sanctuaries within the home where people could worship their, their, the, their favorite saint or the person with whom they were, you know, the, the being with whom that they were, they, they were closest. Um, but how did it end up here? And what does it mean that it's here? And what does it mean that we are in a place that houses the sacred items of others? Uh, and I think that's really the challenge here, again, right? People have these revelatory experiences in spaces like churches or cathedrals, but they are, again, spaces of deep harm to the originating and descendant communities whose works are housed and, per, and in many ways trapped here. Um, so I want to kind of pivot away from, from all of that and look at like what does it look like to be stored in a museum? Well, this is what it looks like. So we have a rack for framed art. Here is the retablo of the Virgin of Guadalupe next to a Pueblo painting and an Inuit print. You back out, it is down this hallway right up there. And this is what our collections facility looks like. Um, it is uh, a hermetically sealed vault where things are kept safe in perpetuity. Um, and that is how museums have historically described what they do and why they do it, to preserve human culture or art forever for everyone. And that's changing, of course, and I think it, it, it needs to change, and there's a lot of people in this room who are committed to making that change and making that happen. But I think what kind of interactions do we have with things in spaces like this? And it's very, very different than the spaces for which they were originally produced. Um, this sort of, in a way, specimen of them, turns them into objects of study rather than living, breathing things that have a life force of their own with which people interact in really profound and meaningful ways. Um, and how can we think of new processes, new ways of relating to each other that can transform this pretty static, sterile, and uninviting place into something that can be a little bit more meaningful to people? We, okay, a couple more slides, I promise. I'm almost done. Um, you know, I think what's interesting is this is the British Museum to come back, uh, a, a hall of treasures, a temple of knowledge, a monument to wonder, but very specifically borrowing the form of Greco-Roman temples and sanctuaries to enhance the visitor's experience of wonder and to manifest feelings of the sacred. But this isn't true for everybody, right? So this is what DMNS used to look like, a more modest version, but still, trying to make a relationship between uh, the Hellenic Greco-Roman traditions that privilege knowledge and the sort of sacred space of the museum. Um, and I think we're out of time, or we got a little bit more. So I guess my, my, the challenge is, is it even possible to make these spaces not only less harmful to originating and descendant communities, but spaces of healing. Um, and I'm happy to talk about what that looks like, what that can look like, some of the work that we're doing here, some of the work that my colleagues at other institutions are doing. But I think it is an open-ended question, and I think we have to entertain the possibility that there is something fundamentally um, inappropriate about housing the collections that we do, and how do we reckon with that, and how do we move forward? Image credits. Thank you.